For Krima Media's Quality, this is Sane Lamini. Joining me today is DA Chief Whip Siviwe Kwahube to discuss the DA's five-point plan to stabilize coalitions ahead of 2024 elections. So can you briefly just tell us what uh, your party, the Democratic Alliance, once changed or updated in terms of the country's electoral and legislative frameworks? Look, currently, as we stand in South Africa, we have seen that our democracy is maturing in a particular way, where we are seeing the uh, the rise of uh, coalition governments, particularly at a local level. And it is clear that this coalition governments are going to become a very permanent feature of South African politics. And be, that being said, it means that our laws need to catch up with how our democracy is developing. And at the moment, that is not happening. At the moment, we've got the Municipal Structures Act and the Constitution broadly, and both which kind of, which, you know, rely on the assumption that there will always be a dominant party in either a council or a legislature or, um, or parliament. And we face a real possibility in 2024 where we might find ourselves uh, without a dominant party and we might find ourselves needing to put together a coalition government. And this has been the driving force behind um, saying we want to develop this legislation that would look at how do we create the legislative framework for coalition governments, not just at a local level, but at a provincial and a national level too. And uh, more so for a national level, because um, currently, Sane, I mean, if you have seen some of the instability at the local government level, it's something that some local governments and some municipalities can uh, withstand. But that level of instability at a national level will be absolutely disastrous. And in fact, ultimately, it is the people um, the citizens uh, that are, are, are the ones that really are the on the losing end of this. When politicians fight and you know squabble about polit- positions and the like, it is the very people that we are meant to serve who become the victims of those broken coalition agreements. So this is the legislative framework we're trying to fix. This is the lacuna in our view that has been created, that it has now emerged. And it's important that parliament leads the journey in our country in terms of finding legislative framework to to govern coalition governments. And now some uh, may say that your party is trying to manage uh, coalitions because it has failed um, to do so recently. We've seen something that has has emerged in Jobek, uh, where we've seen even the mayor Popalata being removed. And what has also happened in Nelson Mandela Bay? How do you respond to that? Look, I mean, as, as I've, I've said, and I continue to say that it's regard, this is passing this legislation is not something, is, is we are not fixing a DA problem. We are fixing a South African problem. And so the, the assertion that, you know, we were trying to come up with legislation to sort of retrospectively fix what has been broken in local governments is untrue. The reality is that we've got to start thinking as somebody who leads the DA in parliament, I've got to start as official opposition, I've got to start thinking about how does parliament fix the problems before they arise? Can you imagine the uncertainty of waking up after election day and realizing that we are um, we have results that will now mean that we've got to have a coalition government and the scramble to put one together? And when we scramble, Sane, that is when we actually decide and make decisions that are not good for service delivery, that, that are about politicians and not the people. And so, yes, there has been absolute pandemonium with some of our metros that we've seen. And again, the victims there become the citizens of Johannesburg, for instance. That we cannot run away from. But starting legislation is not something that's going to currently fix the problems of Johannesburg. This legislation is future focused. It is really literally about looking after our democracy for years to come. Um, under possible coalition governments. And now let's look at some of the measures that you outlined at, at a media briefing last week. One of the measures uh, was suggested that you, you are talking about limiting uh, the motions of no confidence. Now, as a party that has always been pushing uh, such motions, 
Why do you think that setting a limit will manage coalitions better? Look, what we've done <coughs> with the discussion document that we have um, uh, uh, distributed last week is we have looked at various models of coalition governments around the world. We've looked at the German model, the Denmark model, and closer to home, we've looked at the Kenyan model. And what we've tried to do is borrow some of the key elements we believe are important um, in order for us to keep coalition governments stable. And so you mentioned one of these aspects. And of course, we've gone and looked at the constitution and what it says um we've also gone and looked at what case law says because while we don't while we want to limit um the the frequency of motions of no confidence in one year for instance the reality is that we don't want to find ourselves in contravention of the constitution because we ourselves have been as you say proponents of saying we want to move a motion of no confidence when the president or somebody or the premier or the the, the mayor has Uh, not lived up to the constitutional responsibilities. But what we are saying is that as political parties, as we are now headed towards, for instance, a potential uh, national government coalition, we've got to look at how practical is it that we can have uh, motions of no confidence moved against a government every month, for instance, where there's no limit to how many times a motion of no confidence can be posed. Again, This is not to fix a DA problem. Even if we are in the opposition benches, we can appreciate that the stability of a country will be will completely be non-existent if we are allowed to simply move a motion of no confidence against a government every month or every three months. That ultimately means that no government is able to have an economic policy. No government will poss- possibly be able to pass legislation. That government is unable to deliver for the people that it's meant to deliver for. So while this is something that has really been a great topic of discussion um, from a constitutional point of view on our side, and also from saying that, you know, should, would we not be shooting ourselves in the foot when we are not able to remove a government that's performing? Ultimately, the, the trade-off here is creating stability for the people who rely on us to have a government. And, and so it's not cast in stone. That's why this... Uh, Um, consultation with other political parties is important because we want to hear from academics, we want to hear from experts in the field about whether or not this could pass pass constitutional master, number one. And number two, is it fair to say, regardless of whether you're part of that government, is it fair to say, for instance, as an example, no no motion of no confidence based on the same um, sort of set of facts can be brought before a parliament, a council or a legislature in one sitting year, for instance, as an example. So that to say you are able to have a government pass a budget and deliver against it so that we can see whether or not they are able to change lives in the way that they say that they're going to. So again, these are difficult conversations, but we've got to look at what countries, other countries have done um, that have stable coalition governments. And we've also got to legislate um, for, for our current circumstances. And, you know, not a utopian idea. I mean, this is a constitution we have. The idea is that these are the, the parties that we have. These are the problems that dog coalition governments at the moment. How then do we create a legislative framework that is fair, but that will also manage to create stability? Can you also tell us about an electoral threshold of one or two percent that you say is vital uh, to guard against posing instability of coalition governments? Look, of course. And, um, and, and I mean, that's why, again, we are completely open to having these discussions with all political parties, not those that we are even partners with where we govern in certain instances, but all political parties represented in parliament. Of course, this may create, uh, you know, discomfort for some political parties, but I think it's also quite important to note, again, that trade-offs need to be made. It's a statement of fact that running a 10-party coalition government is almost impossible. It is an untenable scenario where you have perhaps um, one or two parties that are one-party people, um, where there's no internal structures in their organization. One day you wake up and they say, well, we're going to vote with the other side. Mm-hmm. Um, one can appreciate that even if you are a part of that coalition government, and of course it disadvantages you, but it really does also disadvantage the citizens of that municipality because enough people have voted to put together a government. And now on the basis of reasons that 
nobody can uh, is obliged to ask you about. You can simply say, well, I don't like the way that Severe speaks. Therefore, I will have to no longer be part of this government. I mean, there's ultimately no um, no accountability at all. So one of the things that we've looked at in with other with other countries, like for instance Denmark. Denmark has a two percent threshold that if you are unable to garner the support of two percent of the national vote, then you are unable to form part of that government or, or or get into parliament. And quite frankly, you know, when when one looks at the constitution, the constitution is quite clear that proportional representation needs to, at the very least create general representation. And I think even the drafters of the constitution then understood that there's no way that you can achieve 100% representation. The PR system by nature in itself has all, has its own limitations. So what we're saying is that yes, we, we can have a threshold, but what it does, it prevents the fragmentation of politics, where for instance, you've got five or six political parties that are then bound by a formalized legal um, agreement And we are of the view that the the coalition governments around the world that have worked have worked largely because there hasn't been a proliferation of single seat parties Mm -hmm. that are difficult uh, to hold accountable. For the benefits of our viewers who have not gone through these amendments, you are also referring to the Kenyan government strategy now uh, to formalize agreements. Why is this strategy ideal for our country? Look, um, the, the, as I said right at the beginning, I think the idea here is to, this, and it's very important to view this as, a, firstly, a, our contribution to the legislative agenda for South Africa, uh, because we are not in any way ready uh, for what is happening in reality in our democracy. We find ourselves, for instance, in, a, in an unenviable position even now in Parliament, where there's the Electoral Amendment Act, which we are rushing to meet a constitutional court deadline. And it's highly unlikely that Parliament is going to meet that deadline. And that shouldn't be the case. The function of Parliament is to pass legislation, legislation that makes that makes a difference in the lives of South Africans. And Failing on doing that is failing to do a critical part of why we are there. And so our view here is that we are introducing legislation that will help govern coalitions, not now, not necessarily now, but into the future. And we've we've premised this on one, that in Kenya, what the, the Political Parties Act of 2007 in Kenya, for instance, established what they call a a political bureau or a a political arbiter. Um, And ultimately what was really attractive about this 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 kind of uh, concept was that a lot of the problems with coalition governments is around personalities and parties that don't get along and the like. Whereas if you can formalize, legalize a coalition agreement, and have a secretariat of the of the coalition agreement that is not one of the political parties, an independent arbiter that will be the secretariat of the agreement. When there are conflicts, the secretariat would have to invoke a conflict resolution mechanism. When there are political parties that wish to pull out of the coalition government, the secretariat would have to say, on which basis are you pulling out of the government? And on which basis, what clause has been triggered? And make public the reasons why a political party has decided to pull out of that coalition government. We're of the view that what this does is that it takes the political sting out of these discussions, where the discussions become about personalities and they become about uh, politicians and not the people. Whereas, yes, you can have political parties negotiating about what happens where, but ultimately the administration of the coalition governments should not sit in one political party alone. Then you also avoid scenarios where people say a political party is arrogant or a political party is taking the lead because you've got, you outsource that entirely Mm -hmm. To an independent arbiter. So we think that that was that is a really crucial part of some of the the, the, the Kenyan model, and I think linked to that, Sunday, which is quite important, is the fact that coalition coalition agreements should be made public. We had decided to look back in two thousand and twenty one to make ours public, but again, it would be something that the arbiter would need to do that make the entire coalition agreement 
public and even the agreements, what we, we agreed to, who gets what, what, who governs what, needs to be public. So that when people do pull out, they understand that and the citizens understand that this political party did so on this basis. Because we've got to bring the people back to be the center of these agreements and not politicians. And lastly, has the party started consultations uh, with the stakeholders? And if so, how has the response been? Look, yes, we've written to all political parties that are represented in parliament as of last week already. And we've really asked and submitted the the discussion document and requested some feedback um, in the next week or so. Because again, you know, we, we, well, you know, every political party and individual is can very well um, submit a piece of legislation in their name and move on with their business. But it's important for us because this is not just making a political statement. We want this legislation to pass and we want this legislation to, uh, to have broad support. And so that's why we, we've written to every single political party that's represented parliament to say, if you have any views, please can you um, send the, them to us in writing so that we can consolidate some of those views. We're also going to be um, also engaging some, as I said, experts in the field, um, uh, taking through the document in itself through a legal process of being making sure that it's legally compliant. We're really going to put in the work of making sure that these pieces of legislation are solid. They, they take a look at the, the different dynamics, the South African dynamics, but that they also enjoy broad support, not just in parliament, but also with other political parties. It's an important piece of legislation. And really for for any other party, for every party that cares about the future of our democracy, we should be getting their support. There was the A Chief Whip, Sivue Kwahube, in conversation with Polity to discuss the DA's five-point plan to stabilize coalitions ahead of 2024 elections.